So with such a vast array of really beautiful and unique antelope species on our game reserve, I thought let's spend a little bit of time looking at them this morning. Good morning everyone, welcome back to another beautiful day on Shamori Private Game Reserve. So with such a vast array of really beautiful and unique antelope species on our game reserve, I thought let's spend a little bit of time looking at them this morning. We've already done a past episode, check it out over here, but uh, enjoy the next couple of minutes with us. So the first guys we'll look at this morning are these guys over here and exactly where we'd expect them to be. These are the black wildebeest or the white-tailed gnu. So I think an amazing thing about these white-tailed gnu or the black wildebeest is they're an endemic species to South Africa. In other words, they were only naturally found right here in South Africa, nowhere else. Their numbers, unfortunately, due to hunting, human expansion, farming and all of that type of stuff, their numbers dwindled down to about six, seven hundred animals in total and they were completely eradicated from the wild and they only were found on a few small protected areas. But since then their population has really increased to stable numbers now. So we're obviously all familiar with the blue wildebeest, that's the other species of wildebeest that we get in Africa. They're obviously far more numerous in numbers and they're the guys that we'd see on the, on the migrations in East Africa for example. These guys are much more nomadic and not migratory. they found out in these open plains over here, they are selective grazers, they feed off of the, the nice green shoots of grass, they're very specific in what they want. They're found in, in three pretty much typical forms in their social units, either a territorial bull standing by himself, he's really strong, really powerful, and he demarcates an area of ground that he fights for, that he reckons has the best access to water, best access to food, in other words, resources, and he stakes that as his territory. Then you'll get a herd of uh, females and youngsters within a, a, a home range that will move between male territories and then you'll get a bachelor herd of young mixed age group of males and uh, eventually when the rut comes around they'll be competing for territories. So I think one of the most noticeable characteristic features on these black wildebeest is the white tail and for so many species of antelope and we'll have a look a little bit later at another unique species that are found in wide open spaces they have really contrasting colors on them for visual communication. And one of the things that happens when these guys, they get a fright or they start running or they're snorting at something, they start this jumping around process but swooshing their tail around all over the place. And it's that white tail that can flash and, and be seen for such a, a huge distance that'll be a, a form of communication to other members of the species, alerting them to potential danger. One noticeable difference between blue wildebeest and black wildebeest is that blue wildebeest almost have buffalo shaped horns. So the horns come out to the side and they curve around, where with the black wildebeest the horns come forward and point straight up and uh, indeed quite formidable weapons when they're fighting and also as a defense. I mean, imagine a, a lion was trying to attack one of these guys. If he gets it wrong, that horn is going to pierce him. So wildebeest are one of the most dominant grazing species out on the African plains. And what you'll find often is that the wildebeest and other antelope species will form an association. Things like zebra, for example, and they'll use that to their advantage. As long as they're not competing for the same food source, it's a benefit that they're actually grouped together. More eyes, more ears to look out for the lions. The more animals there are, the less chance you're going to get eaten by the lion. Let's go find something else. So we've just had a small group of water buck run across the road in front of us. I'm just going to get some elevation and we can have a look. But it's such a characteristic behavior of them moving to thicker bush and riverine areas as a form of defense. There they are there. And water buck society is pretty relaxed. There are territorial males. So the females and youngsters will be 
inner territory of a male. They move within their home ranges and then overlapping with the territorial males. The males though are quite tolerant of satellite males. So as long as another male is submissive, he will be allowed to come into his territory. You must remember with waterbuck, they're occupying quite a unique ecosystem in Southern Africa. And I talk Southern Africa just because we're a dry, hot continent. And waterbuck are always found within a few hundred meters to a kilometer or two of water. Never further than that, they are dependent on water. They drink multiple times per day. The young survive by hiding up for the first three to six weeks of their life in dense riverine vegetation. So their survival and their, their livelihoods are based upon water, thick vegetation uh, and permanent water. The fact that we're on the African continent and such a dry, arid environment in many places, it limits that resource to very, very few areas. So waterbuck have to be quite tolerant of one another because the, the ecological space available to them is just actually quite limited. There's a big waterbuck male over there. You can see those very, very straight but forward curved, slightly forward pointing horns and uh, ridged along the base a little bit. A typical white circle of the, uh, so synonymous with the waterbuck, obviously a really good follow me signal through dense vegetation. Such a noticeable thing with waterbuck is the thick shaggy coat. There's a, a couple of different things about it, but some of the important facts is you often smell waterbuck before you see them. Really, really potent musky smell that comes off of them. It's got to do with the, the secretions and the oil that help lubricate that fur so that when they are in water, they don't get waterlogged. There is stories that predators will avoid them. Things like lion and crocodile won't eat them because of that smell and the taste of the meat, but that's obviously not true because we have seen on numerous occasions, we've seen lion taking down waterbuck. So we saw with the black wildebeest male and females have horns. With waterbuck it's only the males that have horns. You can see the females over there uh, look exactly the same as the male except for the fact that they don't have horns. So all in all waterbuck are quite a pretty looking antelope species. They don't particularly look like they fit in here in this environment. In other words I think most of our antelope species all look the same but waterbuck look a little bit out of place. They almost look like a deer species. Nonetheless really beautiful, really interesting. Let's go see what else we can find. That's the other guy that we've been looking for over there. That's a Gemsbok, an oryx. It's a, it's a perfectly suited animal to dry, arid conditions. And although we can be in times quite lush in this area, we still consider it a semi-arid area. And traditionally what would have happened is your Gemsbok would have moved between wintering grounds and summer grounds for feeding, you know, almost following the rain. So they would have definitely moved into these areas and at other times moved further, further north. They're able to concentrate their urine uh, to, to draw as much moisture and water out of it as possible. So it's a very, very concentrated urine. They take as much moisture out of their food as possible and really when they defecate, the dung is very, very desiccated. All the moisture has been taken out of it as much as possible. And they have the ability to raise their body temperature instead of sweating to conserve moisture. And that's a really important thing because these guys can go for long periods without water. And in, in, in actual fact, they're able to utilize other water sources, things like tsama melons, so naturally occurring wild melons that have a high moisture content. They'll even feed on grasses at nighttime as opposed to during the daytime. Dry grass has the ability to bulk up by about 40% in weight just by atmospheric moisture content. So by feeding at nighttime, they're able to absorb more moisture into their diet. And you can see those long, long, sharp sword-like horns are such an awesome defense against predators. Uh, occasionally we do see them getting taken out by lions but you know the lion has to be really really careful. There has been a number of instances where where lions have been killed by those horns. Again an open field species antelope. So in other words antelope that's found in really open arid environments you can see those contrasting colors will only help accentuate communication over long distances. So it can be a little bit tricky to tell the difference between males and females at this distance. 
both males and females have horns. But some of the differences are that the females' horns are longer and thinner than the males because they don't use them for fighting as much as for defense. Whereas males' horns tend to be way thicker and slightly shorter to be able to accommodate the, the rigors of fighting, if you will. Males also have thicker necks to accommodate all the muscles and that for the fighting. Perfectly suited and adapted to these dry conditions. Let's move on and see if we can find one more for you. That is impressive. That is really impressive. Look at the size of that eelant. Male eelant, the bulls can weigh approximately one ton. The really big guys. You see that uh, impressive dewlap at the front coming all the way down. Males with the tufts of fur on the on the forehead between the horns. Spiral horned antelope, although tight spiral horn, those guys are related to kudus. But I mean, you just see they, they're just absolutely massive in size, huge nuchal humps, really a big powerful animal. Great thing about Yelant is uh, the aggregation, the size of the herds that they can reach. Really, in, in some instances, numbering up to the hundreds when these large aggregations form. Normally you find them in smaller groups, 20, 30, 40 animals in a herd, but sometimes those herds will form together as they're busy moving feeding and you get these large aggregations general mixed feeder. They'll feed off in certain times of the year off of the seed pods from the acacia tree. Those seed pods are highly nutritious. You know, with that animal's bulk, they're not very picky in the quality of food that they eat. They need quantity, so they're eating a large amount of food to be able to sustain that body mass. And again, interesting when they walk, that clicking noise, the sliding, the slipping of the tendons over the, the joints on the bones there gives rise to that clicking noise. For many years and a lot of the times you'll hear it's the, the hoofs busy clicking together but it's actually tendons busy giving that very loud popping sound. So with the babies, the youngsters, I think the one thing that you'll be able to see that makes an earlunt part of the kudu family is particularly on youngsters you'll see that white barring, that uh, striping down the side of that animal, exactly the same as in kudus. And that is very important for the youngsters because, again, like so many antelope species, the mother will stash the youngster. It'll hide up in thick bush and that striping down the body will just help break up the body line, disruptive marking, so it'll be camouflaged and be able to avoid predation. But again, as we saw with the, the red heart beast and the wildebeest and the blessbok, all those youngsters from that family, the Elslafine, they all look identical. Indeed, with this group, the spiral horned antelope, the youngsters look very similar as well. So characteristic traits with each of the family groups, even though the adults look quite different between species. So it is one of the world's largest antelope species. And even though you can get males that reach into the hundreds or up to a ton in weight, they are known for being able to jump well over two meters, really phenomenal jumpers, even with that incredible body mass. So just a, a very unique antelope species. Well, there you go, guys. As our Yelanta moving through the bushes over there, let's let them be. I hope you enjoyed it. We've still got a number of different antelope species to bring you guys over the next couple of episodes. A whole bunch of interesting stuff still coming, so stay tuned, stick around. Hopefully, we'll see you soon. Be safe. Hello, everyone. My name's Andrew Kearney. I'm the Ranger Manager at Shomari Private Game Reserve. I just want to take a moment to say thank you very much for all the support and feedback that we've been getting on our brand new channel, Shamwari TV. If you haven't followed us yet, hit that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up, and hit that notification bell. Stay tuned for our next episode, and I'll see you right here at Shamwari Private Game Reserve.